Hey guys, what's going on? Welcome to the Honest Youth Pastor YouTube channel, the channel that helps believers use biblical discernment in all aspects of life. Today, we're going to do that in one of my favorite ways, which is a sermon review. Today, we're going to be looking at uh, a sermon called Hard Preaching Makes Soft Hearts. Um, each week, we go through a variety of different sermons from a variety of different pastors, sometimes suggested by you guys, sometimes they're pastors that I have found on the internet. This happens to be one of those. I've seen this these this guy's clips posted by a variety of different people that I trust to preach, you know, to, to post really good preaching. And so we're going to watch through what's going to be sort of an intro to a series they're going to be doing on Timothy. Now, like every sermon we watch, we ask three specific questions, and we're going to ask the same questions as we go through this sermon. The first is going to be, do they read the scriptures? Do they use exege exegesis to pull out culture and context and application of those scriptures? And do they preach the gospel of Jesus Christ? Those are the three things we ask for every sermon. That's the three things we're going to ask for this sermon review as well. Like I said, the sermon itself is going to be called Hard Preaching Makes Soft Hearts. And to be quite frank with you, I don't know this pastor's name. I have not watched this sermon all the way through. I think I've watched probably about the first five minutes of it, and then I wasn't able to complete it because we had some other things I had to do. So me and you are basically sitting down, going to this church, just the two of us, not really having heard this sermon. So let's go ahead and get into the review screen here. The sermon itself is roughly uh, 35 minutes. So I'm not actually sure how long this review will be, to be quite frank with you. Um, but I, from what I've seen so far, I'm pretty confident that what we're going to see here today, hopefully, is going to be a really good sermon uh, that you're going to be, you're going to learn a lot from and see sort of how sermon building is done well. That's my guess. I don't know. I, this could go sideways really fast. Um, but let's go ahead and get into it. Ask those three questions and see where we get. So here we go. We've got about 10 weeks or two months uh, coming up to do a... Oh, one thing I, I forgot to say, if you want to watch this whole thing without my commentary to it, down below, there will be a link as always. If you're new here, you didn't know that, but I always put the link for the full sermon down below in case you want to watch it without my talking uh, down there as well. Um, I also, man, I forgot to mention a lot of things down there as well. There's going to be a link to a uh, a free sermon review guide that's going to give you sort of a template if you don't have one on kind of things to look for in the sermons. Uh, it gives you a place to take notes versus also like visual notes or extra spaces. Anyway, it's down there. Check it out. It's, it's free. So there you go. Now, <laughs> now we've covered everything. Let's get into it. A jet tour through First Timothy. So we're going to do a survey and we're going to have to put on our seatbelts because we're going to be going quick. It's going to be a good study. Now, of course, if you've studied the book before, you know the Apostle Paul's had a pretty tough five years at this point. Uh, he had been, I think at this point, logged in at least 20,000 miles. He now had been in house arrest a couple of times, been in prison once, back in prison again. Uh, he then finally gets free, makes a, a tour around the Roman Empire, and leaves some of his younger men in different churches uh, he leaves Titus over in Crete. He leaves Timothy in Ephesus. And poor Timothy, that would have been a very, very tough job to serve in Ephesus. You've got an exploding port city off of the Aegean. Of course, there's a ton of wealth involved. Even we have archaeologically discovered that their toilets, their public toilets, were polished marble. Uh, and all of that wealth would, of course, brought power brokers and influencers and elites and aristocrats from around the world. Also, there were a lot of pagan deities. The Temple of Artemis was up on the hill. Uh, and all of that, Paul warned in Acts chapter 20, was going to infiltrate the church. There are going to be men from the inside who would want to cause division. Uh, we know that there were also women on the inside who were wanting to flaunt their seductions and create distractions. And so what we're about to study very quickly over the next 10 weeks is Paul writing to his protege to say basically there are 10 things that you are going to have to stand firm on. Ten things that you've got to get right in the church if you want to have a healthy church. And the first big thing we're going to see this morning is just the gospel. You've got to get doctrine right. You've got to get the word of God right. In fact, if you get the gospel wrong, you get everything wrong. So Paul's going to say to Timothy, the main thing is to keep the main thing what? The main thing. Got your Bible? Okay, so he's going to get into it. So I want to. I want you to just notice if you've been watching these sermon reviews for a while, the difference as far as how a lot of these sermons start. Right. So he starts off right away. 
right away by giving us just context to what we're going to be reading. Hey, we're going to be reading First Timothy. This is sort of the background. This is how Timothy got there. This is sort of who Paul is, where Paul's at, why Paul's put him there, sort of the real quick cultural idea of around it. So it's not, hey, have you ever been or do you ever think about? It's not any sort of that story thing to open us up into anything within First Timothy. It's just, hey, here's the sort of cultural setting. Here's the background. So now when he gets into first Timothy, and like you said, he's got to kind of go fast because he's only got 10 weeks. He's kind of given himself that timeline. So he's going to go through it pretty quick. But now when we get into first Timothy, as we start reading those things, because you know, the background, it's going to be easier to understand what's going on, why Paul's saying what he's saying, all of those things. So let's go ahead and get into it. He's about to say, open your Bibles. Bibles, open them with me to first Timothy and let's get rolling. Uh, And like I said, this is going to be a little bit of an anomaly because we got to do an entire chapter this morning. That's our goal, an entire chapter, which gives us just enough runway uh, to make it the next nine weeks through this through this letter. Uh, And so if you're a note taker, real simple this morning, we're going to talk about the risk to the gospel or to sound doctrine. We're going to talk about the result of. Uh, of the gospel and what it does in a life. And then we're going to talk about our responsibility to always stand for and defend the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And so let's begin reading in 1 Timothy 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, according to the command of God our Savior, and of Christ Jesus, who is our hope, To Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace and mercy and peace from God the Father in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, that's a really warm greeting. That's a nice greeting, but it's also a strong one. And the reason that Paul is so strong is because he knows that that letter is going to be read to the church. And this is a church that is discouraging his young protege in the faith. Uh, That's why you have this balding old man writing to a 20-something upstart. And notice in verse 1, he actually says, the the apostle of Christ Jesus according to the commandment of God. (laughs) That would be very similar to, you know, if you're a dad sending a a text message to your son and saying, you know, hey, you're, you're doing really good, buddy, and your mom and I are proud of you. Love, dad, the CEO. It just adds a little bit of oomph there at the bottom. A little bit of a reminder to the church that's listening, hey, I'm not only his spiritual father, I'm also one who's been designated and given authority by the living God and my son in the faith, now likewise. So this is important, right? We're talking about sermon building, helping people understand like what's going on in the text. So as he's teaching through, it seems like what he's going to do is be like, all right, here's the context here and reading it sections through and then explaining what the he- first hearers of this letter would have heard, right? So oftentimes we don't think about, or I, I rarely hear uh, people mention, hey, this would have been read out loud. So when the congregation is gathered together reading this out loud, what therefore are would be the implications when they hear verses one and two, right? When Paul is, you know, giving who he is and who Timothy is. Well, what this pastor just did was unpack all that for us and be like, hey, this is what they would have heard. This is going to be sort of the tone so that they know what's happening as well. And I think that's good because, again, we're setting sort of the tone of what this letter is. And most importantly, again, bringing out the culture and the context of what would have the first hearers of this letter heard, putting us in that position with them so that you, you're you not just individually reading this, right? There's so many, and we don't have a time to get into it, but there's so many layers of culture and cultural movement that's happened be- between what is happening when Paul first writes this letter and when it gets to us, that we miss a lot of the cultural imp- implications or read things on top of what's happening here when what, what he's trying to build out for his congregation is accurate, where like they would have heard this and they would have assumed some things along with this. So I think that that's incredibly helpful. And I love that he calls him his true child. You'll see he does that at the end of the chapter two times. I believe in you, Timothy. And technically, that could even mean that at some point in their history, he had even adopted Timothy as his own. I love you, my son. I, I believe in you, my son. I, I, I trust in what you're about to do. It's going to be okay. 
And in verse 3, we see we have basically four directives that are laid out in those first five verses. He says, Tim, as I urged upon my departure from Macedonia, and if you have a pen there, you could even noodle in your margin there some of these directives. He says, number one, Tim, I want you to remain on at Ephesus. So directive number one you could put in the margin is you need to stay put. You got to stay put. That's an intense form of the verb in the Greek. You know, a lot of people don't often realize, especially congregations, how often pastors will consider resigning or quitting a church. Um, I, I have no desire to quit. I have not thought about quitting. I, I really haven't. But I talk to men all the time on the phone who are tempted to quit because of the strife that's happening, because of the way that people oppose what they're teaching. We used to call it the Monday morning blues, where they wake up after a really bad sermon, and all night they wrestle, and on Monday morning is when pastors tend to, to render their resignation, to tender their resignation. Paul says, Tim, you're not going anywhere. <laughs> you're going to fight. You're going to stand. You're going to stay put. You're going to finish this thing. And then the second directive there in verse 3, you see it on the purpose clause. He says, in order that you may instruct certain men not to teach the strange doctrines. And I love that Paul kind of invents a word here. It's a little too understated in your New American Standard, if that's what you're using. He says, actually, it's a command. There is some really bad teaching going on. What he calls other teaching. Etero did a scallion. There's some other teaching going on. And he says... Number one, you stay put, and number two, you're going to clean it up. You're not going to let these other guys come in with their new doctrines that are contrary to the Word of God and keep teaching. You're, you're going you're to clean it up. And in verse 4, he kind of describes a little bit of what that is. He says they're paying attention to myths and endless genealogies, and so these would have been Jewish guys who were pulling some of their Talmudic legends over and you know, you ever read the Catholic Bible, like the Apocrypha, they got all these fanciful stories in there. And then he says also these endless genealogies where they go back to the book of Genesis and they begin to look through the genealogies and kind of pinpoint, well, maybe this was my ancestor and maybe I was a part of this particular activity and, and therefore I'm an important person and I, I really can be a profound teacher of the law. Now, we still do that today, don't we? Don't we still find our worth and value often in some fanciful theory, some human philosophy, or possibly even in the family in which we were born or from which we were born? I mean, it happens all the time. We trace on Ancestry.com. We say, well, my family was a part of the battle at Gettysburg, and, you know, we actually helped plant Harvard. We started Harvard, and then we're, we're part of the people who made it across the pond, you know, and we're part of the pilgrims and the Puritans, and then we were joined with William the Conqueror there. Uh, you know, we do it all the time. Now, let me go ahead and clean this up for everybody, okay? Make it really simple. Yes, everyone in the room, all of us were uh, ancestors of a very famous person who had three very famous sons, okay? So here you go. Every single person in the room is all related to who? To Noah and his three boys. So we're done. How's that? So one of the things that he's doing here that I think is really helpful is uh, he mentioned a few things, actually, so let's try to go through them before I forget. One, he's bringing out sort of the Greek and what it looks like there, like, oh, here's the language. This is sort of the – like some of your translations may you know accidentally downplay it, but the point is they kind of do. Um, but it's really kind of a strong language here, and he's sort of walking us through – the Greek and saying, okay, well, here's what is being said. And some of your translations like give it the, the oomph that it does have. And some of them don't, but the point is just remember, like just acknowledge, like acknowledging that it's there. And then he also goes into a little bit of more context when he's talking about in verse, um, where are we at here in verse uh, four, devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies, talking about some, you know, Talmud and some things like that that are going on, bringing in like Jewish commentary uh, that would have been given on a variety of different subjects during the time and bringing that in. And so he's bringing some, some maybe some culture that people don't, you know, realize he brought in some apocrypha, things like that. But at least he's touching on them so that there's this acknowledgement, like, so what would have been some of these, you know, strange myths or what would have been some of these genealogies? Well, he's bringing that in again, 
important culture and context and not really touching so much on, Hey, this is directly about you. Now he does draw that parallel. And that's why I want to touch on it between like, Hey, we do this with like Gettysburg or historical figures that da, 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 da. like there, he does make that sort of parallel, but he does that to say, Hey, like, like that still happens. But the idea is that what, you know, Paul's telling Timothy is like, don't worry about that. Like that's not important. None of that is important. It's interesting. It doesn't play a part, though, in how you operate within the church. And so he's doing a really good job, I think, of bringing out the Greek, bringing out the cultural and context, making some parallels where, you know, are needed or where help people understand. But he's not diving completely, you know, dumping us into it. And he's walking that really fine line of telling us, hey, like, this is what the Greek says. This is what's going on. Same thing sort of happens now, right? So that we have this understanding. So I think sermon building wise, fantastic. All right. No, no, we're getting in our little ethnic circles and our little subcultures and going, I'm really proud to be this. We're all linked in some way to one famous guy. And now we're done. We're over it. We can move on. See, what's the problem with human philosophy? What's the problem when a church gets caught up in genealogies and YouTube debates about things that really are tertiary? Well, he tells us there in verse four, he says, they're all going to give rise, read it with me, to mere what? speculation. They're all going to give rise to speculation. I love the word that he uses there. It's empty speech. Rather than furthering the administration of God, the movement of God, the the plan of God, which is by faith. If you're adding to the Bible, subtracting to the Bible, and building your platform on the YouTube debates and the hobby horse theology, it's going to lead to, to nothingness. It's going to accomplish nothing. Instead, look at verse 5, look at the adversative, but, but, the goal of our instruction, the reason that we preach and teach, the reason that we herald the word of God, the reason that we hold to the good old-fashioned gospel of Jesus Christ, the outcome that we desire is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. That's the goal. In fact, that's how you know mark number one of a healthy church. If you go, well, is Mission Bible healthy? And when you walk in on campus, you wonder if the preaching is solid. And you look at your discipleship groups and you kind of wonder, is this the, the, the good place to be, the place that God's moving? Arch cardinal number one is, is that, in fact, a group of loving Christians? Because where there, there's hard preaching, there's going to be soft hearts. Where there's true gospel, there's going to be a softening of the inner man. Very important to understand that love is the the internal drive of the will that unconditionally chooses the best under the glory of God and the good of others. And when you're around that, then you know you're a part of a church that's teaching the truth. He says, number one, you got to stay put. Number two, you got to clean up. Number three, you got to hit the target. You got to stick to the gospel and sound doctrine. And verse 8, make sure you maintain the right standard. So I'm not sure why he skips 6 and 7. I mean, six, I mean, so he talked about, verse 5, the aim of our charge is love that uh, issue from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. And then he go, Paul goes into verse 6 and 7, says, Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered away into vain discussions, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things by which uh, they make uh, confident assertions. Um, I may have missed it. I don't think he necessarily read those. He may have covered it when he was talking about, you know, what do you get when you get into like, vain disputes and whatnot that would have been uh would have been that maybe i missed it because <laughs> I, I i don't think i did but if i did I'm, i i thought i was listening pretty closely but now he goes into verse eight um uh, and, and going on in the thing the, the nice thing about let me just stop this and say this because i i don't think maybe i'm wrong and he read those verses and i missed it which would be aggravating if i missed it but um One of the things that's nice about this type of preaching is there's not a lot to interject and intervene on. The building's good. If he did skip those two verses, I have an issue with that. Um, But now he's going into verse to verse eight. Let's keep going. Look at it in verse eight. He says in verse seven, wanting to be teachers of the law, these men who are wanting to be well known and prestigious. These Jewish men, these Judaizers, even though they do not understand what they are saying, 
And in verse 8, he says, but we know. There. So he corrected. He went back and kind of addressed it. Okay. That the law is good if one uses it lawfully, realizing the fact that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for those who are lawless and rebellious, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and the profane, for those who kill their fathers or their mothers, for murderers and immoral men and homosexuals and kidnappers and liars and perjurers and whatever else is contrary to sound teaching. According to, and if you got a pen, pull it out here, in verse 11, you want to underline this, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God. Now, this is so important. So important. He says, there's these guys who come in and they want to be prestigious. And they want to be known as teachers of the law. They're going back and they're grabbing the Mosaic law and they're bringing it in and saying, if you want to be a real Christian, you got to obey all these commands. Paul says, but these guys don't understand what it is they're speaking of. And then he clarifies, in order to be a real Christian, and in order to be a a glowing member of the new covenant, in order to be a glowing member of a local church, you need to understand what the law actually is. So it's vital this morning, friends, that you understand right there the point that he's making. If you got a pen, they're in the margin next to verse 8 and 9. So I just have to say, like, this is... (laughs) Again, I like these because I don't have to interject a lot. I don't have to stop every five seconds and give some comment that should be obvious. Like what he's doing here is encouraging his people as he goes through. He's like, hey, mark in your notes, mark in the margin, like leave something here so that when you're reading over this again, there's some sort of highlight for you to be like, hey, this is something I should be looking at and remembering. And so he's walking his people through this, helping them see, hey, this is what's here. This is what I should be looking at. And what he's about to do, which I think is incredibly important is distinguishing between like who's the law for and helping them understand that in light of what we see in the text not some story not some random thing that he thinks is you know like a cute story but within light of what the text says so let's let's see um, let's see where he goes with this just go ahead and kind of write these statements out and make sure you understand what it is Paul's clarifying and you could picture the law, maybe it's the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. You're going to love the Lord your God. You're going to honor Him and Him alone. You're going to honor your mother and father. You're not going to commit adultery and murder. You're not going to lie and cheat and steal and covet. So just picture that in your mind for the sake of, of perspective this morning. And look at what he says here. Number one, he defends the law as good. Did you catch that in verse 8? He says, these guys come in and they want to be teachers of the law and they want to make you obey all these things in order to, in quote, be Christian. He says, but that's not the way it works at all. But then he does clarify in verse 8 and say, but we know that the law is, in fact, good. Because everything that God does is good. And so the law, for example, the moral law of God showcases the character of God and the holiness of God, and it gives the standard by which man can measure himself. Now, real quick, show of hands. Um, Is any man ever going to meet the standard of God? Absolutely not. That's impossible. In fact, when Jesus came, he even doubled down on the standard and said, it's not even what you do on the outside, it's what you do on the inside. So Paul says that the law that God gives, the standard, is in fact good, but notice what he says next in verse 8. That's assuming one uses it lawfully. That's if one uses it lawfully. And then in verse 9, he clarifies, he qualifies, realizing the fact that law is not made for a righteous man, meaning a justified man, a saved man or a perfected man, but for those who are what? The lawless. And then he goes on. And really what you got here is a bunch of terms that really are just synonyms for the Ten Commandments. Those that are rebellious, the ungodly, the sinners, the unholy, the profane, for those who kill their fathers or their mothers, for the murderers, the immoral men, the homosexuals, the kidnappers, the liars, and the perjurers. He says the law is good. If we're using it lawfully, meaning for those who are sinners, for the unsaved. I think that's important, what he just said there, that um, 
that Paul is really what he's doing is drawing back from the law. He's, he's drawing back to the Ten Commandments. He's, he's referencing like the law he's talking about and saying, yeah, it's good, but it's for these people that aren't, that, that haven't received righteousness from Christ. And so he's making that distinction in this sermon here. And he's, he's demonstrating that this isn't just some arbitrary list that Paul is making up. This is a list that Paul is drawing on as he's talking about how to use the law and what the law is supposed to be used for. So, which I think is incredibly, I mean, that's, that's helpful. He's walking his people through teaching them as he's expositioning through, as he's working through scripture here. So he's doing kind of two things at once pretty, I mean, incredibly well, by the way, teaching them, Hey, this is what's going on. These are the connection Paul's making. This is why it's important. And so as Paul is teaching Timothy on how to teach the congregation, this pastor is teaching his congregation how to read this well. And I just want I just want to note one more time, this entire time so far, we're halfway through the sermon. Within this 15 minutes so far, we have not left what the scripture says at all for some fanciful example, except for like one little time where he drew that example between like heritage. This whole thing is founded, based, anchored in the scriptures, and he's teaching directly from them, which I know isn't, shouldn't be some like grand thing, <laughs> but if you've watched these sermon reviews long enough, you know that like this doesn't happen a lot. The law stands as an indictment so that man can actually sit there and have the, 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 very, the very mirror of God held up, and as they look at it, they realize not only who God is, but all that they're not, and how they fall short of His glory in all of their actions, in all of their words, and in all of their deeds, to the very point that they come to understand that they deserve nothing but a, a eternal execution from the mighty judge. That's what the law does to the sinner. It speaks loudly against his condition. So Paul says the law itself is good if it's used lawfully toward the sinner. Leading to, number three, it's right there in verse 9, or verse 11, according to, this is important, the glorious gospel of the blessed God. Now, the reason you understand and underline verse 11 there is because the syntax of the paragraph, the syntax of the paragraph places the glorious gospel as the baseline against which all else is measured, even the law. So even the law is to support the beauty of the glorious gospel this is why it's really important, and I'm, I'll am i just admittedly say, like, if you listen to any of the sermons I've put on here, because I like to try to do that. If I preach a sermon, I try to put it on so that you guys can see that I'm trying to be as consistent as possible. Um, I don't do a very good job at this. He's done a great job at this, where he says he's bringing out the language, how the sentence is built, and something that maybe we're missing here is that, like, everything, the way that Paul is writing this and speaking about this— is that the gospel is the baseline by which everything else is measured. And he's teaching his people like, all right, so when we're reading this, right, we're going through, we're talking about the law, we're talking about when it's good, who it's used against, who it's not. But the gospel, he says, as this is built, he says the syntax of the sentence, right, which is like for some of us super heady, but the point is this, he then dumbs it down for the rest of us and says, that's just meaning the baseline by which everything else is judged. And so... I want you to see the parallel that's happening because it doesn't happen a lot where you have somebody that's teaching through what the scripture says while at the same time teaching his people how to read it on their own. And so these things are happening simultaneously. And when they do, like they're unnoticeable, basically, like you're not really noticing it probably unless like me mentioning it, but it's incredibly helpful. It's a teacher teaching the scripture like how to read those scripture well while he's teaching you the scripture. I've said this before. I'll say it a thousand times. When you're, when you, if you're a preacher, as you're preaching through the scripture, you are, whether you know it or not, you're teaching your people how to read their Bible. Like even if it's unintentional, you're teaching them when you open your Bible, this is how you should read it. And so what's really cool about what he's doing 
is that as he's preaching through the scripture, he's bringing out these little things that as they sort of look into them and start reading the scripture themselves, they're going to start seeing these hopefully. And then like, you know, as any good teacher would hope, you've, you've picked the things up that I've taught you and then you apply them in your everyday Bible reading. And so this is why it's super important. Of Jesus Christ. Now, everyone in here knows what the glorious gospel is, correct? All right. Are we sinners? Yes or no? Okay. For all have fallen short of the glory of God, correct? Okay. So if we're sinners and we cannot make it to heaven on our own, we require a Savior who can get us there. Who is that Savior? Jesus Christ. He is the Lord who came and lived a perfect life and he died a substitutionary death. And he rose on the third day according to the scriptures and sits at the right hand of the Father to whom all glory, honor, and praise will forever be given. Every knee will bow and tongue confess that he in fact is Lord. And yet he came and he gave his life as a payment, as an atonement for all of those who would repent of themselves and cling and hold on to him. That's why Paul in Galatians 3.23 says you will be shut up by the law and shut up to grace. Literally, the law forces you to cry out and to depend upon Christ. I don't know who this dude is, but I'm telling you right now, like, uh, uh, I don't know his name, but uh, I think we just became best friends. That's, that's what I think. <laughs> I mean, this uh, is just, it's so good. So let, let's get, hold on. I'm sorry. I just messed, uh, messed this up real quick. So let's go and get back into it. That's the good news. That's the good news. I was talking with a group of guys one time. We were sitting around, and there was a young man who was really wrestling through the distinction of law and grace. And one of the older guys actually sat back in his chair. It was beautiful. (laughs) And he said to him, he said, think about it this way. You know what the law is? The law, and he asked him, he said, when you were a teenager, did you have a clean room or a dirty room? He said, a very dirty room. When you were a teenager, what'd your room look like? I've got two teenagers. Let me tell you what the room looks like. You walk into a closet, you open the door, and you're afraid you're going to (laughs) die. He said, you know what the the law is to this young man? He said, the law is, is the light switch in your room. When you walk in and you flip it on and you realize just how dirty everything actually is. I'm 100% using that example at some point. (laughs) And then he said, the law is not the broom that's going to clean it. That's Christ. But the law is simply the light that shows you how much cleaning you, in fact, need. Get it? See, if Paul were here today, because these issues are all still the same, they don't go away, because Satan is trying to attack the gospel. If Paul were in this room today, first thing he would say is, is Mission Bible Church, and anyone who preaches and teaches, don't you ever bend on the core of the gospel. Don't you ever bend. Don't you ever, ever, ever have a pulpit that doesn't preach the beauties and the glories of the gospel. Don't veer off into human philosophy. Don't get caught up being the Girl Scouts or the Boy Scouts. Don't get all fired up to be a social initiative. Don't veer off to where you become the Broadway show and the circus act as a church. Make sure that you guys demand the clear teaching of sound doctrine because it's the work of the word, the gospel, and you don't want to be ashamed of it because it's the power of God and the salvation. And oh, by the way, if you ever have pastors and preachers who veer off, then you fire them and you find a man of God. Don't bend on the gospel. There's always going to be detractors and distractors coming in wanting to mess with what? The gospel. He says, don't you let them but he knows he's discouraged. Paul knows Tim's hurting. So he says, not only do I want you to understand the clarity of the gospel, I want you to understand the power of it. And so keep reading with me here. Keep going. Number two, look at this. He moves from the risks of the gospel to the result of it. He gives a personal illustration. I love this. He throws himself on the chopping block just to encourage his young man. He says in verse 12, Tim, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord. I'm so thankful for him, buddy, who strengthened me because he considered me faithful. And if you have an ESV, it's even better here. He evaluated me and he appointed me for service. So Paul immediately, realizing that his young son in the faith is discouraged, says, hey, let me go ahead and just remind you that uh, 
that, that Timothy, I was a really bad man. I was a really bad man. And yet, because of grace, he chose to use even me. Is there anybody in the room this morning that thinks that you're a, <clears throat> a pretty good man or woman? Let's just go back to the teenagers again since we're talking about dirty rooms. Let's talk about the era 13 to 19 in your life. Is there anybody in the room that goes, I nailed it? I mean, I was just a jot and tittle perfectionist. I nailed it. I pleased my parents. I was on fire for the Lord. You know what? If you, if you, you put me next to every one of the other teenagers in the entire country, you looked at my life on the inside and outside, even when no one was watching, you just say, you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm the man. It's interesting, though, that not one of us would really want to get up and share. I, I want to point something out here because, again, this is basically like you watching me watch this guy because there's not a lot to interject. I do want to say that what he's doing here, I think, is similar but distinctively different than what we see in a lot of sermons that we review. Uh, there's a lot of times where, you know, XYZ pastor would have taken this time to go off on some story about themselves when they were 13 to 18 and told some crazy story about some crazy thing they did before they knew Jesus and like gone off on this very elaborate thing, right? And it may have been like amusing and it may have been like, you know, attention grabbing and it may have like, you know, you know, made some people laugh, right? It would have done all those things likely. But it would have then, as we always talk about, it would have distracted from what was actually trying to be said, right? And, and this is why when I talk about stories, I say, stories aren't bad. Like stories can be really good as long as they don't distract from the scripture that you're trying to um, you're try, trying to teach from. And what he's doing here is something that's really unique. And I, I really like, I'm going to let him keep going because I think it's really important is that he's drawing you in but he's keeping you there. Like he's not distracting you by some random story, but he's making it relatable enough that you understand what he's saying without distracting you with some random story of his life or somebody else's life. And so it, it it's, it's holding that tension of bringing you into understanding what the text is saying without dumping you in the text. While at the same time, he's not telling a story about himself that's humorous or whatever. And I think that's a, this is a really good balance our testimony. And yet in the eternal record, look at this, the Apostle Paul says, let me remind you of what a bad man that I was. He says there in verse 13, Timothy, Jesus was willing to put me into service even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor. And the words that he uses in the Greek, stupid speaker and violent harmer, an insolent attacker. It's like, he's like trying to choose the worst words possible. By the way, that's what the law does if you don't have grace. Law without grace creates a fanatic, a legalistic fanatic that harms other people. Paul says, I was a bad man, a really bad man. You remember the story in Acts chapter 7? Have you ever thought about that little cryptic statement in Acts chapter 7? You know, where, where Luke says, um, there, they were driven, Stephen, outside the gates of the city, and then they took their jackets and they laid them at the feet of a man named who? Remember that story? And you go, well, that's crazy. How did, how did Luke know that? He's writing this massive two-volume historiography, often forgetting that what? He traveled with Paul, and Paul was the one who told him those things. So at some point, Paul says, yeah, I, I was there for that. You know, I was there when they, when, they, when they took Stephen and they put him on that 11-foot platform and they tied the, the big stone to his chest with the rope and then they, they pushed him over the top of it and he fell and he was laying there writhing in pain. And then, then all the older guys, because we were all training in the same school, they all grabbed the stones. And we go to Jerusalem, by the way, together. You're going to see there's stones everywhere and they're all really sharp. He says, I was standing there when they all grabbed him and then they began to pelt him. And I remember the moment that he looked up and it was like heaven opened up because his eyes were peaceful and he was showing forgiveness even to those who were hurting him. And I remember that moment. And Luke, it still pains me to this day. Oh, but by the way, I just want to make sure that no one's ever confused. I was right there. I was holding the jackets to make sure nobody stole them. I truly am and was a bad man. 
He says, Timothy, do you remember who I was? Even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor, I was the man who stormed into those homes and I grabbed those daddies away from their crying kids to throw them to the wolves and to the beasts. Verse 13. Read it with me. Yet I was shown mercy. And if you got a pen, you just write passive voice there in the margin. I was mercied. He did that to me. He spared me. He held off. He didn't execute judgment. And he goes on and he says, and atop that, verse 14, the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found in Christ. He was patient with me, not only saving me, but sanctifying me and putting me into Christian service. And then in verse 15, He says it is a trustworthy statement. Paul only says that, by the way, y'all, five times. Did you know that? Five times. What he's saying is is the whole word is inspired, but these are the things that you have to put at the top of the pile and listen to. See, this is just gold. Like, if you are a pastor looking to say, okay, what are the, like, what are the best ways to, now, to, to be completely frank, I don't have a clue who this dude is. I'm just saying this is good preaching. So if you're looking for like, what are the things that I, that as I'm preaching that I should really pull out or really should integrate? And I think we've seen a lot of these in this sermon so far, right? Not that you should compare yourself to anybody else. I'm just saying like, if you're looking to make yourself a better pastor, preacher, communicator, like I think this guy's a great example so far, at least in this sermon, where he's brought out the Greek, he's brought out the culture, he's really emphasized uh, like that last section there where he very much like humanized Paul. Uh, and again, brought in some culture there about the tying the stone to him, like the things that aren't necessarily mentioned in the passage, but contextually and culturally you would have known would have happened. Like that was really cool. And he didn't make a big deal of it. He just sort of interjected it. And he humanizes Paul brings that to life, really connects that to himself. It seems like he's really like emotionally feeling that while also communicating the gospel to the people he's preaching to. And then here starts bringing in like, all right, when it says trustworthy, right? You can tell he's done, he's done his research. He's studied this well, where he says, okay, how many times did Paul say trustworthy when he did say this? What does it mean? How is that important? And then interjecting and bringing that in here, like so good. And it's all for the benefit of those that he's teaching and shepherding. So they understand like, hey, all this is inspired. Like you just said, these are the things that like you really need to pay attention to though. And it's this small thing that he interjects, but that is incredibly helpful to help his um, his congregation sort of um, compartmentalize certain aspects of like um, of teaching and how to learn and kind of what to look for. It's just, it's just good stuff. It's a trustworthy statement demanding or deserving full acceptance. Read it with me, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save who? Sinners. He says, I was a bad man, but Christ saved me through the gospel. See, a lot of the times we forget, friends, the gospel demands that we acknowledge and repent of our sin. There's so much gospel now floating around, end quote, gospel floating around, and it, it, it precludes sin. It doesn't talk about sin, right? Now, I love Coach Prime and what's happening with, with the Colorado Buffaloes, and so, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to get on Coach Prime's bad side. If you do that, man, you, everyone's against you. Good man, seems to be leading really well. You know the problem, though, is he talks a lot about Jesus and a lot about God and a lot about what the call on his life is. You know the thing he never mentions, though, is sin, It is so wonderful to know what Jesus did. It is so important to know who Jesus was. It is so beautiful to know when he came. But friends, don't miss the fact that Paul always centers the gospel message on why he... Okay, I had had to look this up real quick, just in case you're out of the loop like I am, because I'm not a sports guy. Coach Prime is apparently some reference to Deion Sanders um, and Deion Sanders coaching some college team that I don't, it makes no difference. But the point is there is, there is a relative connection here. Um, Deion Sanders uh, has been, and I don't know if he still is under the ministry or uh, TD Jakes. So you can sort of see the connection of maybe why Deion Sanders is leaving out sin 
all I mean there's we're not going to deep, deep dive into that but the, it seems to be like what this pastor is saying is that Deion Sanders will mention God the call on his life all of that a lot but he leaves out sin when he's presenting the gospel and I'm not making any direct references here because I haven't really done a ton of research but I do know that Deion Sanders has been at least previously discipled by T.D. Jakes. So that may have some connection there. That being said, let's keep going. He did it. The perfect Lamb of God who hung upon that cross and he took the penalty from God for those who deserved it so that you could then forever be in eternal glories with him. If God poured down that much wrath upon his perfect son, imagine how much wrath would have been poured out on you and on me. He came to save sinners. Verse 15, among whom I am foremost of all. Yeah, isn't that interesting? All he's doing there, he says I rank number one, is he's just sharing the, the personal religious experience of anyone who truly comes in contact with God. That's what happens to all of us. When you and I come to realize the holiness of God, all that he is, and then all that we're not, the more familiar we get with how holy he is and how unholy we are, the larger that gulf becomes to the point that we literally just say, I am the foremost of sinners. In fact, you know what's interesting about the sanctification journey? A lot of you know this to be true, is the closer that you get to God, the more you walk in faith with him, the more aware that you and I become of just how dastardly our flesh actually is. Is that not true? There is not a day that goes by. The more that I worship him and I love him, the more that I pray and I talk with him and I look forward to seeing him and this old tent that's wrinkled is gonna be tossed aside and I finally get the new home to heaven. There's not a day that goes by that I'm not more aware of just how deceitful and how sinful and how ignorant I actually am. And yet in Christ, he's going to let me and you come and spend forever serving him in the hallowed halls of our heavenly home. Only in Christ. Paul says in verse 16, the reason that I found this mercy was so that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe. He says, Tim, you gotta remember my story because the same glorious gospel that saved a maniacal, bloodthirsty, family-destroying murder is gonna save millions more. There's power in the gospel. Preach the gospel. It'll transform more lives, Tim. On to verse 17. The natural outcome, the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. It demands praise. And by the way, for all the academics in the room who like the big words, that's an anarthus of teoi, meaning that's a Trinitarian statement. Now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, the Father, God, the Son, and God, the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. This all reminds me of the brother who found me up here. Great guy in the church, real manly dude. He walked up, we were standing right here. And after a service, he, he walks up and he goes, hey man, I, I'm so pumped right now. I said, why are you pumped right now? He said, because I got a lot of friends who still live in the area and they remember my old life. I said, oh, okay, so why are you pumped? He says, because I can't wait for one of my friends to walk in those doors. My old friend's gonna walk up. What they're gonna say to me is they're gonna say, hey, I know who you are. And he said, I can't wait, because I'm going to look at him and I'll say, no, no, no. You know who I was. Isn't that amazing that the Apostle Paul, in the eternal record, actually has the guts to say, hey, listen, I'm going to tell you who I was, because I want to tell you who I am. So, like, I feel like I just need to interject. Like, I know I haven't interjected for a while, but... Um... If you are, this this is in California somewhere, Costa Mesa maybe I don't know. I'll put it in. I'll put it. It'll be in the description where this church is and the name of the church. If you don't have a church home in the area, like I know this is only one sermon. I don't know a whole lot about this church. Obviously vet them. Obviously look into them. Obviously like do all the things that you should do to be discerning when you join a church. But this is one that is seems to be worth checking out if you're in the area. I mean, a hundred percent. Like. <laughs> Like, I, I've watched a lot of sermons, done a lot of reviews, 
been to a lot of churches. This is, this is good. By the way, when's the last time you ever sat around? Like if Paul were here today and he said, don't you bend on the gospel, then he says, and listen, never forget the gospel, hold on to the gospel. When's the last time you ever sat and you shared your testimony again? How often do you sit and share your testimony? I'm really serious because we do them in the baptistry and I'm gonna admit this in public, okay? Paul's acknowledging things, I'll acknowledge things. You all make me kind of wanna cry sometimes. They don't fall, they stay in there because you know with the difference between a man we understand this, right? Is you, you can have tears, but they're not allowed to fall. So you shake. And then they go somewhere, they disappear, right? Where do they go, by the way? They go back in there somewhere. People ask me, do you ever cry? I say, no, except for the baptistry. Hundreds and hundreds of you. Because you get up and you talk about your old life, and then you say, but God, I was mercy." And then you recite some beautiful scripture like Galatians 2.20, yet not I, but Christ in me. And you go into that water. You died with him. When he died 2,000 years ago in a way that we can't comprehend, when he died, you died. And when he rose, you rose unto new life. And it makes me want to cry. Here's my question. We do it once in the baptistry. How often are we sharing it again? Like on date night with our wife. Why does it always have to be just one time with the kids around the table? Grandparents with the little ones. Like, can you imagine Grammy? I was a bad, bad woman. (laughs) I, uh, I said a lot of bad things. I did a lot of bad things. The only reason he married me is because I'm hot, you know, and (laughs) can you imagine what that would be like? That's 100%. We've talked about this before. Just to interject real quick, like, yeah. Like, there's things, I think, that whenever, especially, like, grandparents, if they're saved, like, their grandkids don't know anything about them beforehand. And, like, so there is this powerful testimony involved where they're like grandpa's or grandma's like always been super chill, like super loving, super like, (laughs) like all the super things. And they don't know you before Jesus. And so like what he's saying here is a great example, like a hundred percent, like there are times to share because sometimes people only have known the saved you. They have no clue what, who who you were beforehand. And so what he's saying here is like a hundred percent on great example. And you got this little grandchild looking up at you, you know, and I, I said these things and I lied and I stole and I cheated. But I was mercied. And he gave me a new heart and he gave me a new life. And you got this little four year old looking up at grandma who's like an angel. Grandmas cannot sin. You know that, right? They can't. And right from age four or five, little Johnny Jr. understands, no, no, grandma's not perfect. Jesus is perfect. That's what Paul's doing. There was a pastor down in Texas and he was saying, he was invited to go preach at one of those Texas Christian universities that call themselves Christian but and uh, so he was invited to preach. And so he got a big whiteboard like we do sometimes here, and he put it up. And he said, hey, tell me the gospel in one word. And so the class, you know, 40, 50 students started yelling out words. You can picture what they were, you know, redemption and forgiveness and new life and purity and whatever it was. And so he's just scrawling them all over the place. And then the class got silent. He said, hey, guys, do you think that maybe we missed anything? So for about a minute, they all started to rifle through their little Bibles and class got kind of quiet until suddenly one gal right down here in the front row, freshman, raised her hand and she said, um, I don't know if I missed it, but like, shouldn't we maybe add Jesus on there? So he pulled out his red marker, you know, all the other stuff was black and blue. He pulled out the red marker and in big capital letters, C-H-R-I-S-T, exclamation, underline, and he said, class dismissed. Paul says, the gospel is Christ." And Christ is the gospel. And you never want to forget it. Now, for sake of time, we're going to have to pause there. I promise. Okay, so there is some, I don't know if you can hear it. I can barely hear it in the background. I think this audio that I'm hearing maybe was added like in post. It doesn't sound like it's probably playing like live there. So I can't give them the whole Pavlov's dog. Hey, we're playing emotional music to like, I don't think that, I don't think it's, it sounds like it was added in post to give us the viewer of this video afterwards, 
like the queue. Oh, this is about to end, which it is, by the way. Um, we have less than a minute. We have like 30 seconds left. So it worked for, for, for us, the viewer. But I don't think it's live there. Thomas, next week, we'll finish with number three, the responsibilities that we have for the gospel. And by the way, the whole rest of the letter, that's what it's going to be about. Timothy, here's the way you build the church atop the good news of Jesus Christ. Okay, there you go. That's, yeah, okay. <laughs> this is amazing. All right, so let's go back. So there's the three things, obviously, that we cover each week that we look for in every single sermon. And those are what? One, did they read the gospel? Or did they read the text? Sorry, man, I'm getting all confused. Did they read the text? Of course he did. He went verse by verse through the text. Two, did he use exegesis to bring out culture in the context of the text and application? A hundred percent. And number three, and probably the most important here, did he preach the gospel? Yes, multiple times. Now, of course, that is exactly what the sermon was about, so you would expect that to happen. But he does it multiple times, very clearly, every single time. So there's that. Let me, I'm just going to pull this up real quick because I want to make sure that I can tell you. Um, okay, Mission Bible Church in California. I cannot, again, I don't see where that's from, but I'll put it down in the description. I, I, these are the type of sermons that I love doing reviews on because they're just solid. They actually, we're not correcting like some weird error the whole time or bringing in some sort of comment that really everybody should know anyway. Like, it's just good to see good sermon building, pull out the good stuff that's in sermons and be like, hey, this is what we're looking for. If you're looking for an example of, hey, what is one type of like preaching that is that is solid, that is good, that you should definitely tune in for and definitely aspire for if you're a pastor, like what are the things that you're looking for to put in a sermon? This is it. So hopefully you guys found that helpful. If you did, make sure again, you leave a like, you leave a comment, you do all the things. Guys, thank you for watching this video and we'll talk to you next time.